Thank you so much for taking your time out for us today. I know it's a weekend, it's lunch time for many of us. It's also the end of term today. And a lot of people I know here are in the process of packing and going back to Pakistan. So thank you so much for taking time out for us. Uh, we have Mr. Hassan Iqbal among us to announce us today. He's the Deputy Secretary General of the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz Group. Uh, he has formerly served as the Federal Education Minister of Pakistan and was instrumental in formulating the country's first IT policy. Uh, he has been involved in student politics from his university days and will be talking today on the changing political landscape in Pakistan and uh, the PMLN strategy in the run-up to the next elections. Uh, after, the, after the talk, we will have an extensive question and answer session. So, without further ado, just to ask Bismillah Dear students and faculty, uh, it is indeed a great honor for me to be here at Oxford and speak to you, uh, the cream of uh, Pakistani nation, uh, because you know all of you who have uh, been admitted here, certainly uh, coming to Oxford, have either being accepted here as a faculty or as a student, speaks for your merit and uh, for your uh, talent. So. It's a great, really great honor for me and I, I hope that uh, we can have a meaningful uh, discussion. Pakistan actually today as you know all know is passing through some very challenging uh, times. Uh, unfortunately this is a statement which uh, you know uh, has been there for most of our history and the challenging phase never uh, gets over. And we go through one challenge and then there is another crisis uh, which we have to uh, face. Uh, but the real, I think, opportunity and challenge today is Pakistani youth. Uh, Pakistan is a nation uh, which uh, has about uh, two-thirds of its population less than 30 years of age. And similarly, uh, about one-third of it is less than 14 years of age. Pakistan, in terms of its uh, youth, is even younger than India and China. So this is, a, in a way, great uh, demographic dividend, but also a great demographic challenge. Because if we are not able to invest in uh, polishing the potential of this youth by giving them right education, by giving them the right <coughs> skills, uh, then uh, this uh, uh, youth bulge can be a major destabilizing factor or force in our society. But if we invest in their uh, skill development, if we give them good education, uh, this can be our great advantage in the coming decades. With this great youth power, I think there is also a great responsibility because this new youth power, uh, so as we say, uh, can play a great uh, role in making or breaking the shape of things to come. And I would say that, you know, uh, one another uh, challenge for us is that for the, this youth, uh, n uh, anything before 99 was BC in Pakistani history. So we are basically now, uh, you know, facing a generation uh, which uh, sort of, you know, grew up in post-99 scenario. Uh, they have seen Musharraf regime, they have been very heavily influenced or, you know, in, uh, not if said, to say influenced, but somehow impacted by the politics of the last one decade in which the prevalent discourse was that, you know, both major parties are the same, both parties are corrupt, because this is the discourse which every military dictator uh, tries to uh, promote uh, in order to justify his staying in power. So this new generation has mostly uh, lived through that uh, discourse and has some inherent subconscious bias towards traditional politics. So therefore I think you know we have a communication gap also which we need to uh, overcome and uh, we, uh, we, we need to engage more with this uh, youth so that they can make a more informed judgment and play a more informed role in the future politics of uh, Pakistan. This is not just Pakistan's irony, by the way. This is also a challenge which Indian politics faces. 
because in the past, uh, uh, you know, uh, 10 to 15 or 20 years, another phenomena has happened in both India and Pakistan, and that new phenomena has been the role of private education. What we have seen is that, you know, um, millions of young boys and girls have had good education in private institutions. Uh, they are MBAs, they got uh, MCS degrees, they are in financial sector now, they are in banks, they are in telecom companies. So you find a new emerging middle class in both India and Pakistan, which economically is now empowered, which has education and is more informed because of the global media and information revolution. But the traditional politics uh, still is not uh, uh, you know, uh, aligned with this new development of our society. And you know, because the, this new youth, so as to say, uh, was not traditionally active in politics, the traditional political parties probably still do not cater uh, or provide them adequate space where they can relate to the old uh, traditional parties. So that is also another, uh, I think, uh, challenge uh, which we have in India and Pakistan both. And what you see is that, you know, this uh, uh, emergence of uh, Anna Hazare movement in India, and if you compare that with uh, PTI in Pakistan, probably, you know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, similarity between the two. Uh, both draw support from the same a kind of uh, urban, middle class, educated uh, people who are disillusioned with traditional politics and you know, who have uh, uh, some uh, resentment against the uh, old order. So this I think is a new phenomena which we have to uh, also deal with and try to uh, engage these people uh, so that they can, as I said, make an informed judgment. So the key challenge by uh, Pakistan at 64, where are we today? A question which everybody, I think, uh, is thinking that you know after 64 years, why is it that we still have to be worried that you know uh, where are we headed? Uh, why are we in facing all these crises of governance? Uh, is there any hope? Uh, you know, can we get out of this, or this has become? Uh, a permanent feature of our politics. What is the best way out? You know, we hear from our leaders some uh, advocating a revolution, that maybe revolution is the way forward. Uh, some people say that no, politics cannot work for us, it's only military which can provide us the answers and then some say that no, uh, both revolution and military are not the solution, we just have to go, keep going the democratic path and that alone uh, will answer uh, our pr problems. And then finally, you know, uh, if we know our way, then what will it take to really uh, get there? Uh, you know, uh, sometimes you may know your way, you may know where you want to go, but if you don't have the right uh, a guide if you don't have the uh, right vehicle or tool to get there, you may still be stranded or you may not be able to make it. So these are the questions which I think every Pakistani is today thinking about. And I am reminded, you know, again of Abraham Lincoln, uh, whose quote, who, say, who said that America will uh, never be destroyed from the outside. And if we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. So I think it's going to be more and more about the choices we make as Pakistani nation that will determine our uh, future. If we look at where we are today, there is certainly a lot of cynicism, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, and there is a lot of despair. Uh, but in this gloom and doom, there is also some silver lining. And I think we are sometimes uh, by media, by some leaders, overstressed in terms of looking at the future of Pakistan with gloom and doom. Uh, that everything is black. Uh, everything is wrong with us. And this again, I would go back, you know, I pardon you because we have a certain viewpoint on our political history. But uh, uh, some may agree, some may not agree. 
I think you know this has to do with a with with a collective low self-esteem which we have developed as a nation over past 30-40 years. And why has that low collective self-esteem developed? You know, it is very normal. You meet Pakistanis at home outside. Two, three of them uh, get together, and what do they discuss? Oh, chodo ji sare chora. This is the most common. Uh, sentence you get to hear, you know, that we say that everyone, is, everyone is corrupt, everyone is a looter, plunderer, blah, 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 yeah, no insani nahi hai. Let me tell you very frankly, Pakistanis and Pakistani politicians are as corrupt as any other nation and they are also as good as any other nation. We are a perfectly normal nation. There is nothing abnormally wrong with us. I have had a very close look at Indian politics and I can very uh, you know, uh, uh, accurately describe Indian politics to be more corrupt and more criminal than our politics. Mm -hmm. You see, what you have in India, and we still don't have it in Pakistan, that in India you find at times a very cl close nexus between underground mafia and their politicians. And that, to our, to my best knowledge, I have been in this uh, in this area now for last 17, 18 years. I have not seen that kind of nexus. Maybe in some places, yes, but not a very broad-based phenomena which can characterize our politics. So, we are, you know, we have problems, we have uh, corrupt people also, but we have good people also. We have a mixed scorecard, and that scorecard is neither any worse or any better than any other country in South Asia. So, first thing is for us to understand that we are only as good or as bad as any other nation. There is nothing abnormally wrong. But in our normal discourse or in our self-image, we think that we are probably the worst of all nations. We are the most corrupt people on face of the earth. So that I think self-image has to be reversed because when you have that kind of low self-esteem or low self-image, you get into depression and depression takes you into withdrawal mode. So I think, you know, what has happened is for 30-35 years, these military dictators have bombarded us with this propaganda Okay, we are here because everyone else is corrupt, we are here because no one else is capable. So, you know, you know to justify their staying in power, they have been uh, throwing, us, uh, throwing at us all this uh, propaganda. <coughs> and that subconsciously we have internalized, so and our self-image and uh, self-esteem has gone very low. That we need to reverse, and I think we need to have an understanding of our history. There are some misconceptions about our history which have been propagated. Uh, uh, by certain quarters and we have as a result again uh, you know destroyed our own uh, our own uh, facts of history for example it is very common for people to say that in Pakistan you know these martial laws were only result of the failures of politicians and you will find many politicians saying this that you know martial laws came because politicians failed <coughs> I am a student of history and I invite you to also have your own independent look at all of these martial laws which came. I can say very candidly, none of the martial laws came out of any political failure. None of the martial laws came because there was any political crisis which was threatening the survival of Pakistani state. Each of the martial laws came for the ambition of that army chief. Because that particular army chief either had some ambition or he wanted to protect his job. Except for these two factors, there is no other third factor you can find for any military intervention. First martial law came in 1958, October, and then December. And what happened when uh, Ayub Khan ousted Sikandar Mirza and probably it was December 58. Uh, Pakistan was going through an election campaign. Elections had been called for February 59. In two months time <coughs> there were elections to take place and at that time all political parties were campaigning for those elections. So what was the need or justification for martial law uh, in October 1st and then December 58? The only justification was, which uh, Asadar Khan has also written in his book, and there are other accounts, that Skandar Mirza started inviting fellow generals of Ayub Khan to uh, his you know, presidency or governor general house, 
and Ayub Khan suspected that Skandar Mirza is conspiring against him. And second fact of the history is that immediately after that murder martial law, Ayub Khan gave air base to Americans in Peshawar. So I mean, you know, if you just factor in these two facts, you will come to know what was the motivation of 1958 martial law. There was no political crisis. In fact, if those elections had been allowed to take place, in all likelihood, Hussain Shahid Sorwardi would be the Prime Minister. And if he had become Prime Minister, East Pakistan would never part ways from Pakistan. Our course of future history would have been very different. The second martial law came around 67 uh, and 69 agitation when you know there was this uh, agitation against uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the, uh, Ayub Khan. And what was the nation demanding? The nation was demanding democracy. So people were agitating for democracy. So what happened? When Ayub Khan saw mood of the nation, so he was little, I think, uh, he was wiser than many of his followers. So he decided to quit. And before quitting, he made, a, he made his decision that he will hand over power to the Speaker of the National Assembly, which according to his own 1962 constitution was the uh, constitutional uh, mechanism available at that time. And the Speaker of the National Assembly was from East Pakistan. So an East Pakistani would have become the acting president. And uh, Yahya Khan, who was the army chief, when he saw power going to an East Pakistani, and you know, seeing his own boss in a crisis situation, the account of history again says that he virtually took over power from a Yukon at gunpoint. Ayub Khan was sick and he virtually took power from him on gunpoint. What was the political crisis? There was no political crisis. At that time. Then Yahya Khan became president. He wanted to continue as president and finally he did not accept mandate of the 71 elections and tried to play Mujib Khan against Bhutto, Bhutto against Mujib Rahman just to get guarantee for his own uh, staying as president and in the process we lost East Pakistan. The third martial law came in 1977. It is generally believed that this martial law came because there was agitation in the country. People's Party uh, held elections in the country uh, and there were massive complaints of rigging and there was an agitation by opposition PNA movement. But Professor Ghafoor is alive today, who was Secretary General of PNA, the Opposition Alliance. Nawab Zada Nasrullah died a few <coughs> years ago, but before he, his death, he also used to say this very openly. And uh, Professor Ghafoor Sahib has written this in his book, which is there in the market, that on 4th of July, PNA and People's Party leadership had come to an agreement to go for new elections. So that crisis had been resolved. The, you know, there was a solution to that crisis. So why was then this martial on 5th of July? The hidden aspect of history is that Mr. Bhutto felt very betrayed by his army chief, whom he had uh, appointed with great expectations because he superseded about seven generals and he was appointed as army chief and probably Mr. Bhutto thought that he would stick with him in hour of crisis. And he felt that army did not help him the way he expected to crush the opposition movement. So uh, he, after having this agreement with opposition, made up his mind to change the army chief. And when he asked Ulam Isaac Khan for the certain in the files and, you know, uh, for uh, processing change of army chief because he was Secretary General of Defense, it is said that Ulam Isaac Khan passed on this information to General Ziaulak that your days are finished and he is appointing a new chief. And that information triggered the army coup, uh, military takeover because, you know, otherwise the uh, crisis was over. Fourth martial law came in 1999. And, you know, you all heard the great hijacking drama and the seven-point agenda and the charge sheet that Pakistan was bankrupt. Pakistan was on meltdown, Pakistan was isolated, the Federation was under threat and blah, 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 blah. A few days later, BBC questioned General Musharraf that if Mr. Sharif had not dismissed you, would he still be the Prime Minister? He said, yes, of course, if he had not dismissed me, he would still be the Prime Minister. So, the point is that if 
General Musharraf had not been dismissed, everything would be uh, rose and honey in Pakistan and what not, everything was fine. But because he was dismissed, so everything was bad and you know, Pakistan was in crisis. So again, to protect his job, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, undo his dismissal, he was martial law. So, each of the four military interventions was not out of any political compulsion, was not out of any political failure. They were either because of the political ambition of the army chief, which was the Yub Khan and also Yahya Khan, and then in Ziyad's case and Musharraf's case, they were to keep their position or their office and just to circumvent the removal from the post of army chief. So, this subject. so this is, these are some of the, I think, uh, uh, facts of our history which uh, we overlook and they are very wrong perceptions which uh, exist because there has been a very strong propaganda <coughs> to influence our minds. Similarly, I mean, you know, if we look at uh, some of the follies of our national uh, history, you know, at one time it was being uh, projected that Kargil was something where we were going to take over Sri Nagar and, you know, uh, we were going to liberate Kashmir and it was uh, the cowardice of the Prime Minister who stabbed military in the back and he rushed to Washington and, you know, he denied that great trophy to the nation of getting Kashmir liberated from India. Now, you know, that was thrown at the nation and people believed it for so many years. But only now, the facts have come out when General Zeni uh, wrote his book and, you know, some other independent accounts came that what was it like when Mr. Sharif was forced by no less than General Musharraf himself to go and get a bailout because, you know, they had hit a dead end and there was almost a nuclear flashpoint at that point because India was on offensive and if they, had, if they crossed line of control, it would have been very embarrassing and there was real threat that we could have a nuclear flashpoint in South Asia. And when General Zaini writes that I asked General Musharraf, what is the way out from here? He said that he was black and he was quiet. And then they discussed and General Musharraf proposed that one way out is if the Prime Minister goes to Washington and uh, we can have United States broker a ceasefire, that would be some honorable, respectable way. So General Zaini further writes that Prime Minister Sharif did not agree with this idea. He thought that it is too embarrassing for Pakistan, but then Musharraf prevailed upon him and requested him in the interest of the country you should go. So, you know, now these are the facts which have been all distorted and thrown at us to have a very uh, polluted view of our national history. There are some hidden hands who are very good at throwing, uh, you know, uh, propaganda through different uh, cyber uh, exercises. For example, you know, one common thing you will all hear about us and Mr. Sharif is that, you know, at the time when Pakistan exploded nuclear uh, bombs, so the currencies had to be, foreign currency accounts had to be frozen because India chose its time. They had $29 billion in reserves, we just had $1 billion. And there was real threat that if we defaulted, United States wanted to give us a bailout at the cost of CTBT. Uh, treaty, you know, that, you know, they would ask us to first sign no more explosions and freeze our nuclear program and then we'll give you a bailout. So, the government had to make this decision that should we uh, freeze our foreign reserves so that we can float for as long as we can or we should just see that, you know, allow gradual slippage where people were withdrawing and, you know, maybe that might force an early default. So, when that decision was made, there was this, uh, you know, perception made or created by, I don't know by whom, that they have freezed the money and took it away. You know, if you ask yeah. people in Pakistan, so 100% would say, yes, they have taken it away. You know, this is the perception which has been made. But when you ask them that you are all educated people and you know that banking is the most documented business in the world, you know, if uh, banks close on ke 5 minutes bar jayan, they will not process your check. If you go 5 minutes before the opening time, they will say that our books are closed. Wait for the time and then only we can make the entry in our ledgers. So banking is the most documented uh, business. So if there were any withdrawals, they would not be 
in here or you know not documented anywhere so every account has transactions and those transactions are recorded so this was the easiest case for musharraf to make against mr sharif you know all he wanted he needed to do was ask the governor state bank give me past one month or two months transactions from their accounts and you know you would have found it but there was no such transaction but i'm just telling you that how certain quarters play with our perceptions to uh, keep certain balance of power in pakistan tilted in their favor so it is now very important that one of the very critical i would say uh, dimension of pakistan's future is that how are we going to deal with this civil military relation and how are we going to recast civil military balance in light of the constitution because right now this civil military relation has a great imbalance and this imbalance uh, has had serious consequences in our foreign policy this has had serious consequences in our domestic policies and uh, our uh, foreign uh, relations as i said <coughs> look in 1999 what more could we ask it was a vision of a political leadership that which sense that the nuclear explosions has uh, given us parity with india those nuclear explosions gave us such a golden opportunity in our history because india and pakistan have a symmetry in size in economy in population in every respect you can never be at a level playing field with them you know because uh, they are seven times bigger in population uh, many times more uh, i think bigger in size and all that but nuclear explosion or nuclear episode provided us an opportunity of an equalizer we were standing like this and on that platform the prime minister launched his peace initiative so indian prime minister comes to pakistan Uh, on a bus journey stands at minare pakistan and says ke jab partition hui to hame bade wo ghav lage lekin aaj pakistan ka sikka hai pakistan ki currency hai hum usko mante hain what more could be asked the indian prime minister saying the all those words <coughs> at lahore and saying to the prime minister that 99 will be the year of resolution of kashmir conflict and we will give you an offer which you cannot refuse what more could be asked for but then what happened the kargil episode which sabotaged the whole peace initiative the prime minister was stabbed in his back by his own is his own army chief to derail the whole peace process so these are some of the tragic realities i think in our history and that is why you feel that our party and mr sharif has taken a very consistent position that we are not against army army is our national institution we respect it uh every country needs a strong defense but for strong defense we think that military must take a very a political role and military should not be the one defining the foreign policy of pakistan and de defining the national objectives or priorities for pakistan this is for the people of pakistan to define through their own uh, elected chosen government regime and representatives and unless this imbalance is uh, recast i think you know we will continue to face the same old dramas and same old tragedies and breakdowns in our political process which we have had so this for us is a one of the key i think issues the second uh, key challenge i think which we feel and our party has a very strong view on that is economy of pakistan 